today is our final day. Uh, I, for one, am very happy about that. It's been tiring. Uh, and I'm very thankful to everybody who has been uh, following this intensive course um, throughout, these, uh, throughout these days. Uh, it, it's, I, I'm sure it's been uh, challenging and, and tiring for you as well. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the last two issues which I chose, which I select as being most um, relevant uh, for discussion within this course, which are going to be the binding enforcement of uh, the binding effects of public enforcement decisions and access to evidence. And I'm going to be uh, spending a lot more time um, on the first topic than on the second. Not because I think that the second topic is not important. Uh, I think access uh, is very often really the, the clinching factor and the decisive issue. Um, it's just that I think that there is a limited degree to which the, the legal theoretical discussions on access are the ones that really matter. I think that access will often turn on the way people act and the behavior and the interpretation of laws and not really on, on the theoretical framework, which sounds fine most of the time, and then it just isn't applied. And so um, um, uh, that's why I think that at the academic level, there is, it's, it's a lot more interesting to discuss the issues of the binding effect of decisions than exactly the issues of access. Let me start by sharing these slides. Okay. Right, so um, we have um, we have already spoken a little bit about uh, binding effect of public enforcement decisions in the last days. Um, and when we did this, um, I think most of you have already understood that uh, if an infringement has been declared by a competition authority, that now uh, this infringement is binding in a follow-on action, in a private enforcement follow-on action. But as we will see today, there is a lot more to it to that, and there are a lot more subtopics within this broader issue. So within this issue, I'm going to be talking about nine points. Uh, some of them are, in fact, more than one point merged into, uh, into a single one. And my entire presentation is basically a summary of a paper that you can find uh, that I recently published in the Market and Competition Law Review. Um, if you have trouble finding that and you want to have access to it, for example, to write a paper for the course or something, get in touch and I will, I will send you a, a copy of it. Um, I am also adding there a recommendation of a paper for those of you who uh, speak or at least are able to read in French about uh, the same issue uh, written by a colleague who has uh, given me the honor of also attending this course. And I think she's, she's here today. And let's, as you can see from the list, uh, we're going to be looking at um, first at European Commission decisions, then at NCA decisions broadly. And then we're going to go down to specific discussions about the scope of the binding effect. We're going to look at the material, subjective, and temporal scope then we will look at the obligations of national courts if there isn't yet a decision, but there will be or might be, and uh, a final decision. And then we'll look at state aid and merger control decisions because you know throughout this course, we've been talking about antitrust private enforcement, but right at the beginning, I told you, private enforcement is also for state aid. It can also be for merger control. So we're going to see how the topic would play out in those areas of competition law. And then I'm going to tell you about commitment decisions, which is probably uh, the less familiar part of the binding effect of decisions. It's, it has to do with very recent developments in the case law, and a lot of people are just, um, they just work on the wrong assumption when they look at commitment decisions. And finally, we'll do a very quick sum up of, of what are the limits to these binding effects, how might the court get around them if, if it's possible. <clears throat> so, if you have a decision by the European Commission declaring the existence of an infringement, that is a positive decision, you 
have now, or and ever since 2003, Article 16.1 of Regulation 1 2003. An EU regulation, as you all know, is directly and immediately applicable. So there doesn't have to be a law in the member states transposing this. In fact, it's forbidden by EU law to reproduce such rules, which, by the way, uh, a lot of some of the transpositions in the member states reproduce this rule that's forbidden by EU law. Um, and um, and what's worse, they might reproduce them with with the wrong scope, um, and and that would create additional problems for debates within that member state. So this Article 16.1 says that a, a, a decision of the European Commission identifying an infringement of Article 101 or 102 is binding on national courts in follow-on claims. That's the, the article is rather succinct. But this is not a, uh, a novelty that was introduced by the EU legislator. This is a codification of case law. And you have there the identification of the main cases where you're going to find um, passages relevant to this discussion. But of course, the, uh, the, the moment when this was truly clarified in the case law was in Master Foods, which is underlined in the slide. The, K, the court created this binding effect uh, through uh, a, a Praetorian inter creation of law um, by saying that it was required by several principles of EU law, the separation of powers, the direct effect of these provisions, the principle of sincere cooperation, and the need for legal certainty. And it's important that we keep in mind the legal reasoning that was followed by the court. Uh, especially the fact that it was talking about separation of powers, because that's going to play a role later on when we discuss um, uh, uh, when we discuss some of the things that we're going to look at later. This this case law is still valid today. So just because you have a codification doesn't mean that the treaty provisions plus the general principles, as interpreted by the court, no longer impose on you this obligation. Of course they do and the regulation doesn't even go into further details. It is in fact less precise than the case law tells you. So don't just rely on Article 16.1 of the regulation. You still have to rely on the case law of the court concerning the binding effects of EC decisions. One example of how the regulation doesn't go into as much detail as the case law is that it doesn't say that the European Commission decision has to be final, but that is necessarily the case, right? We're going to see that there is a there is a difference to be made between the effects of a European Commission decision which is not final and the effects of a Commission decision which is final. Um, it's a it's a small difference, perhaps, uh, but there is a difference. So, in my view, the case law is very clear about the fact that a absolute binding effect that uh, there is nothing that the court can do about it. Well, we'll go back to this at the end. Uh, only derives from a res judicata EC decision. And I think that if we look at this case law, although the court has not yet addressed it specifically, it's clear that the same principles require national courts to be bound by negative declarations. So far, that wasn't relevant because there had never been a European Commission negative declaration. Um, there has never been a European Commission negative declaration because uh, so far, even though that, that possibility was foreseen in Regulation 1 2003, it had never been used by the European Commission. That has now changed uh, with the first negative declaration adopted because of the COVID situation. So again, uh, if also if the European Commission says there has been no infringement, this type of behavior would not infringe. Uh, competition law, national courts cannot disagree with that under the same principles that have been quoted and used in master foods. What about national competition authority decisions? Well, um, national competition authority de decisions, you have to distinguish between um, whether you're talking about, um, Sorry, I'm trying to see the chat in case someone is asking me questions and I'm not being successful for some reason. Um, ah, here we go. Um, 
It depends on whether you're talking about the law that derives from the damages directive and its transposition, or the law that derives from the treaty and the general principles of EU law as interpreted by the court. In the second case, this law was applicable before the damages directive. It continues to be applicable after the damages directive. So much like for EC decisions, you have to take this case law into account even after you have a specific provision of EU law that regulates this issue because the case law doesn't cease to be valid. The, the treaty provisions and the general principles do not cease to impose upon you these obligations just because there is now a directive provision which has a specific rule on this. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons, just to give an obvious example, one of the ways in which even though you already have a codification, you might still very much need this older case law or these um, or, or rooting this effect on general EU law. One of the reasons is that the damages directive has a very limited scope. So for example, if you go to court and you claim damages, you're protected by the directive and you have the binding effect of NCA decisions. If you go to court and you, you're talking about the exact same facts, the exact same infringement, but you're not claiming damages, you're just invoking that the invalidity of the agreement, you're not within the scope of the damages directive. And so you might ask, well, does that mean that, the, that, that the, there is no binding effect of, um, of the NCA decisions in such a type of private enforcement action? Yes, there is, but not under the damages directive, under the general uh, EU law, Article 101, 102, plus general principles of EU law as interpreted by the court. Um, and of course, it might also be the case, as in Portugal, for example, that the transposition of the damages directive was broader. And it does not apply only to, damage, to actions for damages, but it applies also to other uh, causes of action. But um, this is the exception, I believe, amongst member states. Most member states stuck to the very narrow scope of actions for damages. In those states, this discussion will be very relevant. And if you looked at the national solutions before the damages directive, you, you will quickly realize that there was just so many different approaches to the problem. There were countries that thought uh, that non national competition authority decisions would never be binding in follow-on actions. doesn't matter if they had been reviewed by a court or not, they would never be binding, right? And those are, for example, Portugal and Sweden. And for this kind of country, um, the discussion on the limits uh, uh, to the primacy of EU law and the possible violation of fundamental rights and constitutional principles is going to be more relevant. Then you have countries that uh, gave binding effect to the decisions of the NCAs of their own state, so their home national competition authorities, but they did so in different ways. Um, so in Lithuania, there was a refutable presumption. Uh, in um, Italy, um, if I, I hope I'm not getting any of these wrong. Uh, in Italy, there was a refutable presumption, but uh, with some limitations on what facts you could challenge, so it wasn't complete. In France, there was an irrefutable presumption, but only for consumer follow-on claims after a certain point when they changed the law on consumer protection. Um, in Spain, yes, you did have a refutable presumption, but not of the NCA decision, even if it was res judicata, only if the NCA decision had been appealed and confirmed by a court. So it wasn't, it's not the administrative decision that can be binding on a court, even if it's final. It was the judgment of a review court, which could be binding on another court. And of course, there were some doctrinal disputes about this, but this was, I believe, the general understanding um, of the extent of the obligations in Spain. And then you had countries um, where you, the, the, the NCA decision was um, creating an irrefutable presumption, even if it didn't, even if it didn't um, get appealed. Um, and finally, you had countries where um, there was an irrefutable presumption established even by decisions of other member states. And Germany, I think, was the only example where that happened. And to this day, Germany is uh, the one that has, the mo has kept the solution and therefore gives the greatest legal strength to uh, decisions of NCAs of other member states. 
this was the theoretical situation. Of course, in practice, there is a lot of doctrine that says, um, a lot of states, uh, studies suggest that national courts would tend to uh, adhere to national competition authority decisions, even if they were not legally required to do so, they would end up following, um, deciding in the same sense as the national competition authority had decided for whatever reason that might be. But I, I don't want you guys to overestimate the, the impact of that because in reality, we do have precedents where a, uh, a private litigant would go to court uh, following on a decision and then he would not be able to prove the infringement. The court would say, you haven't met your burden of proof of the infringement that had already been declared by the court and by the NCA. And we do have an example of that in Portugal, although uh, the example that I'm thinking of was one where um, the NCA decision had ultimately been annulled on procedural grounds. So it, it wasn't anything substantive uh, that, the, that the infringement didn't occur. It was just a procedural reason. Um, but still, the, the, the NCA decision had been annulled, and then the court decided that the claimant had not met its burden of proof of the existence of the infringement, which had been identified by the National Competition Authority. Um, then we have the issue of how you determine the binding effect of NCA decisions, regardless of the damages directly. So without that provision, um, how do you, how do you, where do you take from the case law uh, that this is so? Okay, so the case law uh, first tells us that national rules on burden of proof may need to be adjusted to ensure the effectiveness of EU rights. I give you one example there, but you know, this is very old case law that we've known this for a long time. In Kojeko, the court had an opportunity to discuss this issue, but it, it, it found that the specific, specifically in regards to this question, it found that there was inadmissibility, so it, it avoided having to answer it. But Advocate General Kokot did take up the opportunity to provide some clarifications, and she argued that the binding effect of non, remember, we're, we're not talking about the directive here. The, the Advocate General was interpreting the law before the directive, and she says that this binding effect is required by the principle of effectiveness. She justified this namely with a reference to the special complexity of antitrust infringements. And she indicated that in all likelihood, we would be talking here about indicia or prima facie evidence, meaning that there would be a, a refutable presumption. Uh, this solution that the Advocate General proposed goes in line with what we've seen the EFTA court propose in one case. And also it goes in line with the European case law on commitment decisions, which we're going to look at later on today. So it, it, is, it is a harmonious solution within the case law that we already have. And of course, you now have a, and I already mentioned this to you on the first day, you now have a referral pending where finally, uh, a referral from Spain, where finally the uh, ECJ might really have to clarify this issue because that's the first question of the referral and it doesn't seem like there will be a way to get around it. Uh, so in this Repsol case, maybe finally we'll get a, a position by the court specifically on whether NCA decisions applying 101 before the damages directive already had some binding effect and what, what effect would that be? The discussions uh, have always been about NCA decisions of the, the NCA of the member state where you are litigating. There has never been a case where that was not the, where a, a, a decision of an NCA of another member state was being invoked. Um, but I think that if you are basing these effect, the, the, this logic on effectiveness, then the same logic applies regardless of whether or not the NCA decision is from your own country or from the or, or from another member state. In fact, um, you know, it, it, this is, I think, fairly easy to understand. If you're saying, well, it would be because of the special complexity of antitrust infringements, it would be too difficult for a private claimant to prove the existence of this infringement if unless the NCA decision has prima facie evidence. Well, then that's true, regardless of whether or not 
uh, it was adopted in your country or it was adopted in the neighboring country. That doesn't really matter. It's still going to be too difficult to prove the infringement. Um, and by the way, this is also harmonious with the solution of the directive itself, as we will see later. For uh, it's, it's the exact same solution that the directive sets forward for the legal value of NCA decisions of other member states. So, you know, if given that the court is showing a tendency to interpret um, uh, the EU law prior to the directive in a harmonious way with what the directive sets out now, uh, this would fit in very nicely. By the way, there have been, as far as I'm aware of, there has never been a discussion in any uh, private enforcement action in Europe uh, that I know of um, about the binding effects of NTA decisions from a non-EU country. And uh, this is important because the UK is about to become a non-EU country, and the UK is a gigantic hub for antitrust private enforcement. It has been at least so far. And there are so many pending cases in the UK um, that it will continue to be necessarily for a few years. So unless they negotiate what we negotiate something into the uh, treaty um, on, on how they're going to, on the continued relations between the EU and the UK, uh, unless, unless there is a clause there specifically for this issue or, and for antitrust, uh, the, the NCA decisions of the UK will start being treated as a third country decision and therefore they will not be caught by the, uh, the damages directive provision, and maybe they will not have any effect even under this case law. We don't know. Um, maybe the principle of effectiveness can be used to extend the legally binding effect to third country decisions. Um, there are complicated issues there. You know, we wouldn't be too shocked to do that for the UK, but maybe for other countries whose legal systems we might not necessarily think are solid enough or provide enough judicial review. Uh, that might be a problem. So we'll have to be careful on the precedents that we set there. So what about the, um, the new regime, the damages, following the damages directive, what is the solution? You have there the provisions that are relevant for this. So it's mostly Article 9 and 9, 1 and 2, plus a few definitions and recitals 34 to 36. And again, remember, this only applies to action for damages unless the transposition has a broader scope, which is rare, but happened, for example, in Portugal. So the solution of the directive is that the decision of your own state has irrefutable, sets up an irrefutable presumption, what is also called as a iudis et de iure presumption. And the decisions of the, mem the, the, of the NCAs of other member states you have to grant them at least refutable presumption value, a prima facie evidence or juris tantum. This is the minimum. You can go further, but as far as I know, only Germany went further and said that there was also be an irrefutable presumption. Um, Petra asks in reply to something I just said, she asks, what if I know that the NCA from a specific member state is not working properly? Yeah, this is the kind of discussion um, that led to this discriminatory treatment between the decisions of your member state and the decisions of other member states. Within the EU, um, as a rule, we have to, every member state has to comply with the rule of law. Every member state is, is bound by EU law, uh, when, especially when applying Article 101 and 102. And so these kind of discussions, uh, to be fair, I know that I know that there is a bottom of truth to it, but they always sound a little bit paternalistic uh, because, you know, it's it might be that uh, that a national competition authority of one country might not be as good as as another, or in one case it might have not done such a great job, or, or you know, there might even be corruption. We never know. We have to we have to think of all the theoretical scenarios, uh, but. There are, this has been discussed on many levels in the EU before, uh, namely in what concerns the recognition of judgment from other member states. Don't forget, we're not just talking about the NCAs, we're talking about the courts of that member state. You have to doubt the, the functioning of the courts of those member states as well. And this gets tricky politically and also legally. Um, in any case, this is, the, this is the solution that we have now imposed by the directive. If there is a final decision, you must recognize that it sets up a prima facie evidence or a refutable presumption. And um, 
these kind of situations are rare, but we do have examples of them. So it's not like, it's not a theoretical discussion. Uh, I know of two examples. One of them went on referral to the ECJ even two times uh, because of uh, private international law issues. And that's the fly law case. And that involved uh, uh, a cross-border issue between Lithuania and Latvia where the MCA decision of one country was invoked before the courts of the other. You also have, uh, you know, as I said, a lot of private enforcement cases are being litigated in the Netherlands. And one uh, beer case uh, against Heineken was, even though it, it, the facts relate to Greece and the damages were in Greece, they were litigated, it was litigated in the Netherlands. And so a decision of that NCA was invoked before the Dutch courts. Uh, so it does happen. It's not a theoretical problem. NCA decisions uh, are binding if they're final. So when are they final? They're final if uh, the appeal for the deadline has expired and, and, the, and the undertaking did not appeal. Uh, they're also final, and this is true not just for NCA, but for EC decisions. They're also final if there was an appeal, but not on the existence of the infringement itself, only on the amount of the fine. And this happens a lot, especially at the European level. Um, if you are appealing just the fine, you haven't disputed the existence of the infringement and you no longer can. So that part of the decision has become res judicata. And um, there are some legal complications to that because the decision might be annulled uh, on the, on, because of the, of the uh, issue of the fine. Uh, but that's not, that's not a normal outcome. That's not what we would expect. If, if the appeal concerns the fine, why would the decision be appealed? If it's just a fine, why would the decision be annulled? Uh, if it's just a fine, the court will use uh, its jurisdiction to alter the amount of the fine and uh, determine the new amount. So, um, yeah, if, you, if, if the appeal is not concerning the existence of the infringement, that part of it becomes res judicata and it can be invoked and, be, and before the national courts and has binding effect in that regard. There can also be an appeal, but not by the undertaking against whom the claim is filed. So, for example, if you have cartel, several cartel members, one of them appeals, but the others do not think, for example, of the drugs cartel, which we saw, uh, it becomes, the decision becomes res judicata in relation to all the others and not in relation to the one that appealed. So it does have binding effects in relation to the other. Of course, there are some complicated issues down the road there, especially together with joint liability. but. Um, this much we can say. And then there is another problem, which is that uh, the decision becomes final when no ordinary appeals are possible. And, uh, you know, ordinary appeals is a, it, first of all, it's not clarified what that means. Uh, from a Portuguese perspective, that would mean, for example, that the constitutional court appeal is not considered, and an appeal to the ECHR is not considered. Um, as our special possibility of an appeal to the Supreme Court to uniformize case law is not considered. So I've given you three examples of appeals that might change the, the outcome of uh, the whole discussion of the public enforcement decision. But the, according to the directive and its transposition, um, the decision becomes final and binding on the national court before these appeals. These appeals don't affect that binding. Uh, effect. So this means that you might have somebody going to court, they wait for you know, the, the first instance appeal, the second instance appeal of the decision, maybe a third instance appeal, and then they, and then they go to the court and they say, hey, no more ordinary appeals, we've been waiting for your decision on, on our damages claim, now you're bound by the existence of this infringement. And the court says, well, yes, I am bound, and it says you have a right to damages, the infringement is proven, you quantify the damages, here you go. And then a few months after that judgment comes a constitutional court or a, a ECHR judgment that says, no, this, this decision cannot, this public enforcement decision cannot stand. And what happens then? Right. This is really complicated uh, because, you know, you have, apparent, it's already, especially if the, if the um, decision in the private damages case has, has become res judicata. If it hasn't, if you're still discussing it on appeal, yeah, yeah there's a solution. But if, if you haven't, if it becomes solidified in the case, in the, in the, uh, if it is res judicata, you apparently cannot go back to say, no, there is no infringement. The court said there was an infringement because it was bound, but that decision was annulled. Really strange and a strange option uh, 
here for the why. It's not entirely clear to me why the directive said that ordinary appeals were irrelevant. Um, no, extraordinary appeals were irrelevant. Um, Filippo asks, is the appeal before the NCA itself or before member states or EU courts? In other words, do you need to wait for a final ECJ decision for a DG comp decision to be binding? I'm not entirely sure I understand your question, Filippo. So if, um, you, could, could you maybe turn on your microphone and explain what you mean? No, no, I think you answered it already. Sorry, it was, was before. I was just understand, like, in Italy, an appeal to the judiciary can take 20 years, you know, so do yeah. you need to wait until the final position of the highest you, the Italian court until you can file a, a claim or not? But yeah. I think you answered it already, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and then there is a, there is a problem about uh, a procedural discussion, really, um, about what must you allege? when you're invoking the NCA decision. This is what we, we call in Portugal the burden of allegation. Uh, I don't know how to translate this. Um, it's different from the burden of proof. It's what you have to write in the, in the claim form. What, what are the facts that you have to allege? And, you know, this hasn't really, the directive says that the, the decision has to be binding, but it, it's, it doesn't really specify what you need to allege because this is a procedural matter governed by national law subject to effectiveness. So, for example, one judge might say, all you need to say in order to prove the infringement is to invoke, this decision was adopted and this decision uh, identifies this infringement. And you quote the uh, operational part, the, oper the operative part, and then maybe you quote some recitals that are needed to clarify. Uh, other judges might say, no, 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 you need to set out the facts that it very clearly uh, specify the infringement. And then you refer to the decision, right? So do you have to reproduce the facts? Do you basically have to do it like a standalone claim and then invoke the decision and say it's all, every, all of this has been proven? Or can you just, you know, skip over this because it's, it is proven according to you and just say, well, you know, the infringement is this one is declared in the decision and be very much more succinct. Um, we don't know how this is going to play out, and this this is affected. This could have an impact on effectiveness. So the DCJ might one day be called to clarify that. Then there is the material scope. Okay, so we know that there is a binding effect, but what is the material scope of that binding effect? And it doesn't matter if we're talking about an EC or an NCA decision from here on. When we're talking about scope, I'm, I'm discussing both of them together. Okay. Um, the binding effect is limited to the existence of the infringement. And the recitals of the directive tells us that, uh, and this, this has been transposed into most member states legislation or many of them. Um, it tells us that this includes the material, personal, temporal, and territorial scope of the infringement. But we know that this is not clear. We know that because national courts have already been interpreting this and they've come up with very different interpretations of what, what this means and what exactly they are bound by. And it creates many disputes between the claimants and the defendants about exactly to what are they bound. And I would, if somebody is interested in digging more into this, the high watermark for me of the precedents that we have all over Europe is the recent judgment of the Competition Appeal Tribunal um, in Royal Mail versus DAF, so versus DAF. So that's a trucks cartel case. And there, the Competition Appeal Tribunal does a fabulous assessment. Um, not just, it's amazing, not just because of its abstract, um, uh, almost doctrinal approach to it, of how you justify what part of the, of the decision is binding and why, but also because it gives you a great case study of how you go through a decision and identify point by point which one of those facts, which one of those paragraphs and parts of paragraphs are binding. So it's in, in, in the, 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 the CAT has done an amazing job here. And the, the basic conclusion that it, it has arrived at is that the part of the decision that is binding is the operative part. Nobody, nobody discusses that. So the infringement that has been declared is the one that is declared in the operative part. However, 
the operative part hardly ever allows you to understand what the infringement was except in a very vague way. And so you need to go to the recitals of the decision to the, to the, before the, the actual operative part um, in order to understand what that infringement is. So which recitals are going to be binding? Not all of them, of course, only those which are essential to the conclusion in the operative part. Only those without which the conclusion in the operative part would not stand, which means the, 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 the paragraphs that discuss the, that give us proven certain facts or that discuss the meeting of the legal requirements of the re requisites of the infringement in question, going down the list of the several requisites, right? Those are the ones that are binding. If you, the national court cannot disagree with any fact that the decision sets out in the absence of which it would not have been possible to conclude that the infringement occurred as it, as it is being declared, right? Um, but of course, keep in mind that the scope of the infringement might not be clear from the decision. So people usually think, ah, oh, you know, this is great. I have a decision declaring an infringement. Um, it's binding and it's easy to go to court. That, that sometimes is not the case. And this is especially true when there has been a settlement because uh, the competition authority might have been negotiating the content of the decision with the, uh, the, with the company's uh, cartel members or whatever uh, in exchange for that settlement. And usually what the companies want is vagueness. Uh, they, want, they want it to be, you know, they, they're willing to admit to the infringement, but don't, don't put too much information about what the infringement was. This is their main concern. And, it, and they can be so successful in this strategy that the decision doesn't really allow people outside of the case who are not addressees of the decision to really understand exactly what the infringement was. And we've had an example of that recently in Portugal in the insurance cartel decision, I think I've mentioned this before, where the competition authority decision says, uh, this is an infringement uh, X, Y, Z, uh, which for large clients, right? the cartel affected large clients. And it doesn't say anywhere what a large client is or who, they, or who the large clients were, a list or a general definition. So you do not know exactly the uh, scope of the infringement. You don't understand exactly who was affected by that infringement. And uh, you don't know it even from reading the recitals of the decision, probably because uh, the, you would only know it from evidence that is being quoted, um, which you know, is not being reproduced, it's just being referred to in the decision. Uh, maybe it's confidential, maybe it isn't, you don't know, maybe you can have access to it, maybe you can't, you don't know, but not from the decision itself. So you don't really understand um, what the, the scope there might have been. And it's arguable that if, if a, and a competition authority is this imprecise, uh, that it might be depriving, uh, if it's the European Commission, Article 16.1 of the Regulation 2003, if it's a national competition authority, Article 9.1 of the Damages Directive, might be deprived of their effectiveness uh, because it will be very difficult for people to assess, especially small undertakings or consumers. Uh, it's not reasonable to tell them you have to ask access to evidence in order to understand what the, what the infringement was. That's not reasonable. And the competition authorities shouldn't want that. They shouldn't want a million consumers to have to do individual access to evidence requests the, to the companies or the competition authority or whoever in order to understand if they were affected by the infringement. That would be a nightmare, right? So, um, especially because if one consumer asks for access to evidence, the other consumer cannot use that evidence because the access was given only for that consumer and limited to the use that that consumer wanted to give. So the competition authority or the companies really would have to answer one request of access to evidence to every claimant uh, well, in a, certain, in a certain possible interpretation, to every claimant that wants to understand what the infringement was. That's just not, that's just not reasonable, and clearly that destroys effectiveness, because if you have a small, the expectation of a small amount of damages, you're not going to go for an access to evidence request, um, have that probably denied, have to go to court. I mean, this is just not reasonable. So there is a big problem with effectiveness there. Um, and this brings up the issue of whether or not the national court might just ask for clarifications of the decision from the competition authority. Yeah, it might, but in order for the court to do that, 
there already has to be an action before the court. So somebody would have had to have taken the chance of filing an action for damages without even knowing if they're affected by um, this um, by this practice. Or if the national law allows a, a pre-filing discovery claim, um, and uh, and then again it has th that party is going through all these costs and things just to just to have access to evidence to identify an infringement. Are they really going to do that? Probably not. Grigoris asks, do appeals on point of law before, before uh, courts of cassation, cassation uh, qualify as extraordinary appeals too? Um, I don't think so, but we don't know. So uh, each national legislation, each, each national legal order has its own understanding of what an extraordinary appeal is. But of course, the concept here is not one of national law, it's one of EU law. Um, if, and national law will have to be interpreted in conformity with the directive. So ultimately, it's up to the courts uh, in Luxembourg to clarify what an extra, extraordinary appeal is. But I would be surprised if, if appeals on points of law would be, a normal appeal on points of law, would be considered an extraordinary appeal. Still on the material scope. Um, the only, so going back to the, what I was saying about the competition appeal tribunal judgment, only facts which are instrumental, meaning necessary for the conclusion uh, on the existence of the infringement, are irrefutably established. The same, it, meaning that um, a superfluous finding is not binding. So if, for example, if you have a decision where the, the competition authority went as far as to quantify the damages that the practice in question caused to consumers or to clients, and it's talking about an object restriction. Um, and even if it's doing that, this was happening, for example, in Portugal and, and other countries, it's doing, it's quantifying the damages in the context of saying how serious this infringement was to justify a certain amount of the fine. In my view, that would not be binding because this is not indispensable to the finding of the infringement. The finding of the infringement, because it's an object restriction, is not dependent on the proof of effect. It certainly doesn't require the quantification of damages. And even though that's useful for the justification of the fine, that is a different discussion from the existence of the infringement. So that part of the decision would not be binding. And that can be good for uh, claimants, and that can be good for defendants, or it can be bad for both, I don't know. Um, but then there are other issues that are a little thornier. So for example, the positive economic test under 102, that's integrated into the prohibition of abuse, right? So the conclusion on that necessarily has to be binding. But um, if you're talking about the ex individual exemption uh, of 101.3, um, the European, European Commission or National Competition Authority, what it does is it has the burden to meet the, uh, to prove that the requisites of 101.1 have been met, that it does, and then it entertains the discussions of the whatever claims uh, the companies bring forward, the addressees bring forward about 101.3. And it says, well, you argue this, but we, we disagree, and that is not met because of that. So to the extent that the, com the commission does that, it discusses a specific argument and says that, is, that requisite of 101.3 is not met, and, there, and, and it has to do that in order to conclude that there is an infringement. If it did that, that is binding. But if it, if it didn't do that, there is nothing to prevent the company from going before the uh, follow-on uh, court and saying, look, we didn't discuss this 101.3 before the European Commission, so uh, there is nothing in the decision relating to this, and you can't say that we are prohibited from claiming it. Meaning, um, unless they are putting forward arguments about 101.3 that have already been dismissed by the competition authority, companies uh, are still, uh, defendants are still free to try to persuade the national court that 101.3 is met, right? That they do merit an exemption. Um, I am less clear, it's less clear in my mind whether or not the same would be true for uh, the Walters case law of overriding uh, general principles. Um, and the reason why I'm less clear on that is that 
first of all, it would have been very weird if they had not raised that point already before the competition authority. Um, so already that would be suspicious. And, and then if you could say, okay, it hasn't been raised, so the competition authority didn't discuss it, so they can still raise it. That, that's one approach, maybe. But another approach is to say, well, the, the commission would have raised it, or the competition authority would have, surely would have raised it of its own initiative. If, if, the, if there's something that is so important that there's such a conflict of, of fundamental values of, our, of the constitutional order, uh, that, rec that, there is an, that there could be a conclusion of a rogue overriding general principle, surely the competition authority would have taken this into account when it did its assessment that there is an infringement of competition law. So mm, I, I, I don't know, I would have to reflect more on that. And then um, about negative declarations. Negative declarations by NCAs, so this is different, we, I'm, now I'm only talking about NCA, not about the European Commission. But negative declarations by NCAs are not binding. And by the way, this is a little bit superfluous what I'm saying because NCAs cannot adopt negative declarations, right? So this, this kind of goes without saying. Neither the NCAs nor the review courts uh, that are controlling NCA decisions uh, can adopt a uh, negative declaration and that derives from Tele, Tele to Polska case uh, for NCAs. And it was uh, discussed in Porzeko. It was raised by the court itself. Should we extend this to review courts? But then the court didn't take a position on it. I think it's fairly obvious that Tele2 Tele Polska also has to apply to the review court. Um, and so the National Competition Authority cannot make a negative declaration. So obviously, we don't even have to get into the discussion of whether a negative declaration would be binding. It can't be um, because they're forbidden from doing them. OK, but you know. Uh, defendants are, are uh, quick to point out that this means that only the infringement is established and therefore that the claimants must still prove the damage and the causality, which are the other two requisites of liability set out in EU case law. And that is absolutely true uh, to the extent that one of the presumptions does not apply. So for example, the presumption that cartels cause damage, the presumption of passing on uh, if the requisites in that case are met, um, and if the decision identifies a, an effects restriction, and these are very rare, so usually competition authorities do object restriction decisions, but if there is an effects restriction, the decision necessarily has identified anti-competitive effects on the market. And so it might be that in describing, it's, it's likely that in describing the anti-competitive effects on the market, um, it has looked at the impact of that practice on the market. And so within the context of an effects decision, you might have a lot more um, in the way of binding facts that are relevant for a follow-on claim than in the context of an object restriction case. Let's move forward to the subjective scope. The subjective scope, um, when it comes to um, when it comes to the case law and the regulation, uh, you don't find any clues there really about it. So you don't really know who is bound by this. Against whom can you invoke um, the binding effect of a public enforcement decision? It's not in there which doesn't mean that you cannot derive from the rationale of the case law the answer to this question. The tendency of national courts, uh, I quote a decision there as an example of the cap, but it's a very old decision, you know, 2011. So private enforcement was still very much in its infancy there and, and the thinking has evolved a lot since then. But um, I think even today, it's fair to say that the tendency for national courts everywhere will be to say only the addressees of the decision are bound by it. Some who are more familiar with antitrust will take a step forward and say, the addressee of the decision is the economic unit. It's the undertaking, and therefore it's the economic unit or the legal successor, and therefore those are also addressees of the decision, they're also bound. Some of them will not be that sophisticated and they will say it's the legal person which is the addressee of the decision which um, 
makes no sense. It makes no sense, uh, not even as a matter as a matter of EU competition law, but it also makes no sense as fairness. Uh, the only the only logical reason to say that would be that uh, only the addressees had the chance to defend themselves. Yeah, the economic unit had a chance to defend itself. If you address a decision to a parent company, the subsidiaries, uh, and then and then you 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 do a follow-on claim against the subsidiary. The subsidiary was already defended in the case by the parent company. There is nothing that the subsidiary can say now regarding the existence of the infringement. Uh, uh, if, you, if you already have accepted the economic unit uh, premise of liability coming from Skanska, uh, there is nothing that the subsidiary can say that the, comp that the parent company wouldn't have already said. In fact, the subsidiary's behavior is controlled by the parent company. The subsidiary is going to say whatever the, co the parent company wants it to say, unless the parent company decides to you know, let it loose. But then that's, that's their prerogative. That's their freedom to, to do so. Uh, and the other way around is even more evident. Um, if, if the decision has been addressed to the subsidiary uh, and you, it, it, it got a fine from a competition authority, does anyone really expect that the subsidiary did not have to talk to the parent company about how it was going to defend against that? Uh, of course it did. So if you're going to file a claim afterwards against the parent company, of course the parent company was involved. Or if it wasn't, it was because it didn't want to be. It could have and decided not to, take a, not to play a role in the defense. Um, because of course it's going to suffer consequences within the group of whatever liability is established for its subsidiary. Then you have uh, the, another approach to this, which is that the binding effect is based on the separation of powers, the, the exclusive powers of the European Commission, primacy, and the need to ensure uniform application of EU law. This is what master food is based on. And so if you understand this justification, you understand that actually the binding effect of decisions has nothing to do with effectiveness in this in this sense of uh, per, you know you've you have already had a chance effectiveness or procedural economy you have already had a chance to defend yourself so we're not going to relitigate this issue that's not what binding effect of EC decisions are based on the binding effect of EC decisions is based on separation of powers you national court cannot contradict something that the commission has already said if the commission said this is an infringement you cannot say that it is not an infringement and if you understand that you understand that the EC decision has to be binding erga omnes. It doesn't matter who the addressee of the decision is. You, you might be invoking the, I mean, I, it's, it's probably hard to come up with uh, an example where, my, where this might arise, but commitment decisions do give us some uh, examples of impact on third parties. Right? The EC decision will be binding erga omnes. And by the way, this means this has implications for the right of appeal of the EC decision. And we see that in the, in the judicial practice of the court when it comes to commitment decisions. Third parties who are not addressees of the decision, but are affected by the commitment decision because of the contractual links that they have with the, with the, the person who offered the commitments, they have a right to, com to appeal the commitment decision. Why? Because they are affected by them and because if they didn't, they would end up being bound by a declaration, uh, by, by binding effects of this infringement, which then they would have no chance of challenging. Right? And they do have, they can challenge them directly in court. And that is, uh, and so the whole system is harmonious in that sense. And uh, I've already mentioned the problem of joint liability. Um, I, I'm not going to go into this again now, but, but it, is, it is a very complicated minefield there of um, to what extent will you uh, hold a member of a cartel liable for the share of damages of another member of the cartel if that other member has appealed the decision and so there is no binding effect yet in relation to him. The decision might be annulled in relation to him. You heard uh, Martin talking about this on Wednesday. Um, and it's, it, it's complicated and it, it's, it gets even more complicated at the procedural level because then there are questions about, well, does that mean that the, the defendant can call the other um, cartel member to the case and the court is obliged to accept that the other guys get added to the case, the ones who, you know, the decision is not binding in relation to them to prevent this kind of situation from happening. But then that means that you are, you, the claimant does not have a right to litigate against just one person if it wants to. 
uh, it's forced to litigate against all of them, and that might also be complicated. So there, um, that also raises interesting questions. Let me go to some, some of the comments I have here. Uh, Petra asks, what if the parent company was not informed by the subsidiary, which can be even, so they, they can prove that the parent company was not informed by the subsidiary. Yeah, this doesn't matter. So if you have, uh, if you look at the case law on the liability of the parent company uh, from public enforcement, what you see is that every single possible argument has been put forward by uh, parent companies to say, we didn't know, we couldn't know, we didn't control, we never did anything, we never even set foot there, you know, all possible arguments. And the court has always said, could you have exercised decisive control or not? Yes, well then you're responsible. You know, if you didn't know, that's your problem. It would be, and listen, Petra, the, the, this, is, this has to be the conclusion because otherwise frauds would be too easy. It would be too easy to escape the law. You just set up a subsidiary. Um, you go, you, you have a, lot, a nice lunch where you say, listen, I don't want to know what you're doing. Do whatever it takes uh, to get these prices on the market up and don't tell me anything. And uh, then you escape liability. And the commission is never, if the commission has to prove that you knew, that's never going to happen. Right? They're never going to find evidence. If you're, if you're remotely sophisticated, they're not going to find evidence of an email uh, or a WhatsApp message from the subsidiary guy to the parent company guy saying that, oh, we're doing a cartel. So this is really about, this is really crucial to the efficiency, to the efficiency of EU competition law. You cannot require that kind of demonstration. Um, okay, so <clears throat> let's move on uh, to the subjective scope and what concerns NCA decisions. Now, prior to the damages directive, um, and therefore also after the damages directive under, under EU law, general EU law, you have a prima facie evidence value, so an irrefutable, uh, a refutable presumption. And that's rooted on the principle of effectiveness, the way that it was built in the case law. And that rationale does not depend on the identity of the addressee of the decision. So when you ask who is bound by this declaration of infringement of the NCA, that depends on a case-by-case -case assessment rooted in effectiveness. Would it be too difficult or impossible for the claimant to show the existence of that infringement if there is no um, prima facie evidence value of the damages directive? Right? That's what you have to be considering. But you also have to be considering, in the case of, of invoking it against a third person, so not an addressee undertaking, you also need to consider whether you're not imposing a prova diabolica on the defendant, right? If it's too difficult for the defendant to disprove the existence of the infringement, that's also a problem. So in, in this sense, I would say effectiveness is gonna have to swing both ways. Uh, you, can't, you can't impose uh, a, an unreasonable burden on, on the defendant. And after the damages, so this continues to apply after the damages directive, but after the damages directive, you have a new um, rule of presumption, right? It, you have a reference to the, sub, the, you have the idea that a reference to the subjective scope must be understood as referring to the undertaking, meaning the economic unit and the economic successor. Uh, basically, what I'm suggesting is that when the directive says that uh, there has to be a binding effect, at some point, this is going to be clarified by the court. And the court is going to say that um, the binding effect is for the addressee of the decision. Who is the addressee of the decision? The addressee is the undertaking. The concept of undertaking has been clarified already in public enforcement. And this is homogeneously, has to be homogeneously applied to private enforcement. So basically, Scott Scott. And it's going to say this and it's going to say, well, therefore, at at the very least, the undertaking as addressee of the decision, meaning economic unit and economic successor, are bound by this decision, uh, which means a parent company is bound by the decision addressed to the subsidiary and vice versa. Um, binding effect does not, however, encompass managers, unless they were the managers were the addressees of the decision. This happens in some member states. For example, in Portugal, the decision can also be addressed to a manager. Uh, and we've already discussed the other day the, that the issue of the liability of managers is governed by national law, not by EU law, because the decision is not a, the, the Articles 101 and 102 create obligations for undertakings, not for their managers. So you cannot derive a right to compensation 
against managers from EU law, but you can derive it sometimes from national law. And if you can, the issue of binding effect might be raised. Um, no EC decision is ever addressed to a manager because there are no fines for managers at, EC, at the EU level. But some NCAs do. And if they do, well, it's reasonable to say, depends on how their transposition has been written, but it's reasonable to say that they are an addressee of the decision and therefore they are bound by uh, the, 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 the value of irrefutable presumption or refutable if it's a decision of another NCA, of a NCA of another member state. And um, why, uh, a question I ask you is, why would it be too difficult to prove the infringement against the parent company, but not against the subsidiary? I mean, think about that. If, if this whole thing is based on effectiveness and you're saying, and some national courts, namely in Spain, have already said this, huh, that in the trucks cartel, that the binding effect does not, does not extend to the subsidiary. Why? The, the reason, don't forget that the principle of effectiveness before the damages directive continues to apply. And that's the whole point of the damages directive, effectiveness. If the legislator, and uh, if you look at, and, and generally, if you look at the situation and you say it's too difficult to prove the infringement unless you have this presumption, why all of a sudden it's not too difficult if you claim against the subsidiary instead of the parent company? It makes no sense to treat these situations in a differentiated manner. Effectiveness is in question exactly in the same way. And this conclusion is the only way where you're going to get around the sausage gap. If you don't find, uh, if you allow this kind of binding effect to be connected to the legal person instead of the economic unit, the result is going to be corporate restructuring, right? As whenever it's not the ultimate parent company that has been the addressee, it's too easy to get away with not paying the fines by just making that legal person disappear, right? And of course, if you have an economic successor, Skanska applies in full solving the sausage gap problem. Um, and you have also to apply that lesson, therefore, to the uh, binding effect uh, of the decision that it, it extends to the successor. On the flip side, of course, uh, in the interest of defendants, if any of the legal persons of the economic unit appeal the decision, then um, the decision is not final for every legal person of the economic unit, right? So you cannot claim that uh, the subsidiary didn't appeal so the decision is binding in relation to them. That makes no sense. We ha always have to treat the addressee as an undertaking in the sense of competition law. Sanders asks, uh, despite the binding effect of a decision, if a legal person is not mentioned in the public enforcement decision, do I understand it correctly that there might still be a discussion in private damages action whether a parent and a subsidiary are to be regarded as one undertaking? So for example, a discussion on whether there was a possibility to exercise decisive influence or if a successor is to be regarded as the same undertaking. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you, you will have to have this discussion, what is the undertaking? Are they within the same economic unit? Um, however, in usually this discussion will be made simpler by the by the 90% or above presumption that is set out in the case law. It doesn't say 90%. It says, uh, uh, you know, all, uh, owns the entire or almost entire shareholding of the subsidiary, something like that, directly or indirectly. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, Portugal has put this into its, uh, its transposition. Uh, we've, we've, we've gone that far. We've not only established the liability of the parent company, Spain did that too. And we are, these are already exceptions within the member states. So we had, Portugal and Spain already foresaw Skanska before it happened, right? We already established the liability of the parent company. Not only that, but we also codified the uh, case law presumption of dominance, of control, sorry case law presumption of control um, for shareholdings of 90% or above, um, direct or indirect. So that will make it easier because that will also apply to private enforcement um, as you extend the logic of Skanska. But if you don't, if you're not within that presumption, yeah, you have to show control, but it's usually not that difficult to show control. You're usually talking about shareholdings. Um, you know, this isn't merger control where you're going to get incredibly complicated situations where you have to say he's a minority shareholder, but uh, all the other action, all the other shares are dispersed and he effectively controls the company. But, I mean, it's possible theoretically, but that's not usually what's going to happen. And Ignacio ha asks, what happens if the parent and the subsidiary 
are addressees, but only one of them appeals the decision. So I think I've answered this with the flip side comment there, which is that it doesn't matter. Um, only one of them needs to appeal the decision because then the economic unit has appealed the decision. That's my, that's my view. The economic unit thing has to, has to function both ways. It's good for claimants, it's good for defendants, right? Um, it, so you have to respect that this is a functional concept, not a legal concept, and not a, a formalistic concept attached to legal person, personnel. <clears throat> Let's move on to temporal scope. Um, the, for, oh, there are several things you can discuss about the temporal scope. The temporal scope of the infringement itself, which can be different, for example, in the, in the there, well, there are several cartels I could point to where you have uh, one infringer that only came in at a certain point in the life of the cartel or then or went out before the others ended the cartel. So the subjective, there's a, an overlap here between the subjective and the temporal scope. Um, so you're going to have to see against the person who you are claiming, what is the period of the, the duration of the cartel or the practice that they have been held liable for. And only there will they be bound. Then you have the issue of the temporal scope of the sales. This one, this one is really delicate, and it, most people don't don't think of it. Um, if you have if you have the European Commission saying that a cartel had a first meeting on the first of January two thousand, right, and it had it la its last meeting on the thirtieth of December two thousand and five, does that mean that the effects of that cartel started on the first of January two thousand? Probably not. Probably these people after this first meeting had to go back. They had to make certain decisions. You know, maybe the, the, they have conflict, depends on the, on the market. Maybe there are contracts that are ongoing that they can't really change until next month or until some months down the road. And so it, it's not like you can say uh, every, every invoice that you produce on the, starting with the 1st of January 2000 is affected by the cartel. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't. We don't know. It really depends on the circumstances. Uh, was the was the decision is the decision of a nature that is likely to be implemented immediately, or is it of a nature that requires some time before it can actually trickle down to the market and and its effects being felt? So the this is a really complicated discussion, which I I I am guessing everybody's just going to have a tendency to glaze over and simplify. But if we were to be very rigorous. This could be a point for discussion. And the same thing at the end. You know, just because a cartel, you have a last meeting where you say, okay, this is the end, guys, no more. It doesn't mean that the effects will end exactly on that date because some of the things, just like you apply the same reasoning as the beginning, some of the effects might be lasting and um, uh, you might still have invoices or whatever issued after that date that would have been affected by the decisions that you took before. Um, so if you're talking about uh, prima facie evidence for NCA decisions, it's interesting to note that you don't really have a temporal succession of laws issue for uh, EC decisions. Um, um, sorry, you, don't, you have no temporal succession uh, issue, uh, succession of laws issue for EC decisions because of master foods, which says this, was, this has always been this way. And you also have no succession of laws issue uh, if you're, only invoking the prima facie evidence of NCA decisions. So it is only if you are saying that it is an irrefutable presumption established by the NCA decision that you need to discuss whether the directive new rule is now applicable, right? Because otherwise you can just rely, or subsidiarily, you can just rely on the prima facie evidence value that already was established in case law before that. And then there is a temporal, another temporal succession of laws issue uh, for, this, uh, for this irrefutable presumption. Sorry, this, uh, this is what I was talking about. Um, and here, um, this is associated to the other problem of whether the evidentiary presumptions are a substantive or procedural provision. And uh, we've already discussed this before, so I'm not going to go again into this problem. Obligations of national courts, if you still don't have a decision. So if there is uh, an investigation going on, which has not yet arrived at the decision, or there has been a decision, but that decision is still being appealed, what happens then? What's the obligation of the national court? Well, um, this has also been discussed, uh, and you, everything here is rooted in the duty of sincere cooperation between member states and EU institutions. 
the national court has to avoid contradicting findings of infringement uh, that are final by the European Commission. And in order to do that, uh, it has to be careful. So if the decision has been adopted, but it's not yet uh, res judicata, the, the case law tells us that the national court cannot decide that the infringement does not exist, right? Um, that's, that's just not open to the national courts in this scenario. It is required to take measures to avoid a potential contradiction and also measures that are needed to protect the effectiveness of the rights. This might be, for example, interim measures. Um, and so it basically has two options. It can suspend the proceedings and await the, 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 the end of the appeals before the general court and court of justice. So await until there is a final decision, right? Um, the other only option that it has is it doesn't wait and it refers the validity of the EC decision to the court, um, which might be a little bit superfluous if the decision is already being appealed, right? But maybe it has other grounds to, to raise about the validity of, of EC decision. So in other words, if there is an appeal going on, the national court cannot just say, ah, there is no final decision yet, uh, so I'm not bound by it, and I don't care that the European Commission said that there was a cartel. I don't think there was. No, it can't do that. It has to wait until the end of the case, until it does have a final decision. Um, which, by the way, it doesn't mean that it can't say that there was an infringement. It can. So what it can do is contradict the EC decision. Right? So if it wants to take the chance uh, that at the end the decision is annulled, it can do that because technically that wouldn't be any contradiction. It's not contradicting the court because the court wouldn't be making a declaration that there was no infringement. The court would be making a declaration that the decision uh, for whatever reason has to be annulled. It's not, an, it's not certifying the absence of an infringement, whereas the decision is certifying the existence of an infringement. And that's why you need to treat them differently. Um, and what happens if it's an NCA decision? So not an EC decision, but an NCA decision. I think that you're going to have to apply this. This hasn't been discussed, right? This, we, this is just theoretical uh, debate. But I think that you have to apply the same reasoning um, now, at least, because of not Article 9.1 of the directive. Because if you, don't, if you don't do that, you're destroying the effectiveness of that provision, right? If, if an appeal is pending and the court can just say, ah, I'm not bound by the decision yet, so there's no infringement. By the time that the appeal is over and the court confirms that there is a an infringement, um, there is no way to retroactively go back and make the and solve guarantee the effectiveness of this right to damages that this person had uh, based on an infringement that was declared by the NCA. So I think that you're going to end up when the court is asked if it is. I think you're going to end up with harmonious solution for EC level and NCA level. Um, if we were talking about if the decision has already been adopted and is being appealed, what if it hasn't yet been adopted and there is an investigation going on? There, uh, the obligations are a little bit lighter. So there is still, through sincere cooperation, there is still the duty to avoid potentially conflicting decisions. And this is specifically set out in, in Regulation 1-2003, it says that the court may assess, may assess whether it is necessary to stay its proceedings. So there is no obligation here to stay the proceedings. Why? Because uh, if a decision has been adopted, there is an obvious risk of contradiction. If the decision has not been adopted, there is just a potentiality very remote of contradiction. There might be no finding of infringement in the end. So you have to treat the two things differently, but there is a risk. And so the the solution of the of the, the regulation has been to say that the court is not required to stay proceedings, but you know, if you are to be a stickler for sincere cooperation, this would probably be your advisable path, right? You should, and and you can even you don't have to wait for the parties to to do this because this is an obligation of the of the member state and therefore of the of the court as a, a sovereign body of that member state. And so this duty, this, this decision to suspend may be exercised ex officio by the court. Um, 
And the national court, in this context, it can resort to uh, cooperation with its national competition authority uh, or with uh, the European Commission uh, and request information. It can ask the commission, hey, uh, when is this going to get done? Just so I can organize my case. Um, you know, do I, just tell me, do I, am I, am I, are you going to take a year? Are you going to take two, three years? Is, is it foreseeable? Because if you're just going to take a year, maybe I can uh, go ahead with uh, some steps. I can, you know, take care of the disclosure request. And by the time that's over, you guys have had the decision and I know I can move on. So the, com the commission has also a duty of sincere cooperation and it has to inform courts um, of, of, of uh, it has to reply to this kind of question. There is no equivalent obligation uh, from EU law for investigations by MCAs. Uh, I don't think we can derive that from EU law. At least it's not obvious to me how you might. Um, maybe through the damages directive, um, but dubious to me. Uh, what it might derive from is national law. That depends. Depends on each on each legal order. Alexandru asks, what value would the national court's decision? What, uh, what value would the national court decision have in the EC or an NCA's investigation? Alexandru, could you explain? You're talking about the judgment of, of the review court, is that it? No, uh, I was, uh, so basically the situation you're referring to is that we have a proceeding before a court uh, and also a proceeding before, a, a, let's say, a national authority, right? So uh, let's imagine that the national court will issue a decision which is a private, a private enforcement decision yeah which is which is or might be different let's say yeah. let's say that is different from from the conclusion of the of the uh, authority okay so there is no uh, no binding effect whatsoever so the decision of a private enforcement court does not in any way restrict the powers of uh, the national competition authority much less the european commission to decide if there is an infringement of 101 or 102 uh, and in fact, you know, you have, I think I've already mentioned, you have specific examples of that happening in Portugal, whereby, uh, for example, in the gas bottles case, you had a private enforcement action first. It went to the Lisbon Appeal Court uh, and they said no infringement of competition law. And then after that, you had a public enforcement investigation. Competition authority said there is an infringement. It went up to the Lisbon Appeal Court and the Lisbon Appeal Court said there is an infringement. Exact same contract. Um, so this this can happen and it and it does happen and anka asks what happens in the case in case of conflicting decisions if the national court does not suspend um well it depends so if the private enforcement case is still being appealed there might still be a solution if it has become res judicata um there is no solution within that litigation, as far as I'm aware. We can have some advanced academic discussions about that. Um, these discussions have been, you know, if you want to go over on a flight of imagination now, some of these discussions have been raised, for example, by Professor Daniel Sarmiento, uh, now about the, the decision of the German Constitutional Court. It's a really interesting debate. If you have a res judicata uh, decision that infringes exclusive EU competencies, um, does EU law require you to have some mechanism in national law to be able to revise that judgment, even though it re it's res judicata? Difficult, maybe, but you know, the, generally case law in the EU says res judicata has to be protected, but there are some very narrow exceptions. Maybe this would be a narrow exception, but you know, very complicated situation. Maybe not necessary because there is another path, which is to say, well, the, the national court infringed its obligations. It should have suspended the action. It did. It should have suspended the case. It didn't. It said there was no infringement, and now the European Commission says that there is an infringement. I was damaged, and you file a tort action against the state for the damages that you would have obtained in the uh, private enforcement case. The problem with that is the level of uncertainty about whether you would be successful in uh, the private enforcement claim. Right? You've proven the infringement, but you still have to prove causality and damages, and so some national courts will be will naturally tend to be protective of their own of their own judicial system and they might have a, a tendency for a restrictive interpretation of the liability requirements uh, of course keep in mind these liability requirements are not defined by national law they're defined by eu law but 
you know, it's still the national courts applying them and they might say, ah, you wouldn't, you know, you didn't prove that you would have actually proven these damages in the damages action. Uh, so you, act, you would have to litigate the case of, the, of the, the damages case within the tort case against the state. And that's just really complicated. Not sure that will, that is actually an effective remedy because we've never had to test that as far as I know in, before any court. A really complicated situation for sure. Um, and let's move on to the state aid and merger control decisions. Case law has already, uh, you know, most people don't know this, but case law has already clarified the binding effect of state aid decisions in the context of private enforcement, especially in those two cases. I mean, I only know in those two cases. Um, if the European Commission has decided that a measure is not state aid or that it is compatible state aid or that it is unlawful state aid, of course, this is an exclusive competence of the European Union to make these assessments um, of um, uh, um, following a notification of a, of, a, of a state aid to it. And therefore, the courts are going to be bound. And just, you know, same reasoning we had before, this effect has to be erga omnis, right? Because um, the addressee of a state aid decision is a state, but of course, this has ergo omnes effect, namely towards the beneficiaries of the state aid. And this is, again, perfectly harmonious with judicial protection and access to justice because the beneficiaries of the aid are also entitled to challenge and see decisions. So they are always, they always have access to protection before the courts of the European Union and also, of course, before the courts uh, of the member states in question. Um, if if what happens though, if the European Commission has initiated a formal examination procedure, so it has asked that a certain measure for that was given, um, the state data was given to a company and that was not notified, for example, and the commission says notify it and it's investigating it, but there's no formal decision. Well, um, this means that there has been already a kind of preliminary, necessarily there has been a preliminary qualification by the European Commission of the measure in question as state aid. It has looked at that and it says, uh, this is not, no, this is non-notified state aid and you need to notify it, right? And this, this assessment is binding on national courts. Um, there, there are a few more caveats here. I'm simplifying this a bit, but, um, this, this aid is binding on national courts who must take all the appropriate measures, therefore, to protect uh, and act in conformity with this finding of the European Commission. And that in requires them to suspend the implementation of the decision in question. Um, think about the situation. So somebody goes to court, to a national court, and says, look, this, uh, this guy has received, my competitor has received state aid. Um, I want you to order him to, re, re, to um, uh, give back the state aid that it has received um, while we await the decision of the European Commission on whether or not this decision is unlawful or not. And the national court, um, really has a, 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 a decision to make here. It's possible that at the end, the European Commission is going to say, yes, it was unlawful because it should have been notified, but um, it's, you know, it is lawful now. We're looking at it and we're going to authorize it. In that situation, the company will not have to return the state aid, but it will have to return the interest calculated in accordance with the state aid regulations. Uh, so the court can decide, well, I'm not going to recover, I'm not going to order recovery just yet. It can't decide, it's not free to say, I'm not going to order repayment of interest. It knows that the repayment of interest, that is going to have to be done necessarily because there is already a decision that there was unlawful state aid because it was given without notification. So the interest is going to have to be recovered, right? Um, and it might need to adopt some kind of provisional measure to ensure, uh, imagine that there is a bankruptcy going on or whatever it is. Well, I don't want to go down the bankruptcy path because those discussions are even more complex. Uh, but the, it, some, depending on the facts of the case, some provisional measures may be required. And the important message here is that the national court cannot suspend 
uh, cannot decide not to, cannot suspend the case and decide, mm, I'm not going to look at this, I'm going to wait until there's a European Commission decision. No, no, no. You have to act now, otherwise you're, you're not complying with your obligations under EU law. So, for example, if, um, if the, this is easier to understand, it, it applies to the interest, but it, it's easier to understand if, if the claim is for a suspension. So somebody says, the, uh, the state has awarded my, my competitor state aid and it hasn't given it yet, please suspend the effect of this decision, right? And it asks even for provisional measures for it to be suspended. By the way, I've complained to the European Commission and the European Commission has sent the state a letter saying, uh, this is uh, state, this, this, this looks like unnotified state aid. Um, in this situation, the court is not free to say, I'm going to wait until the final European Commission decision on whether this is lawful, because it knows that the member state has already infringed its obligation. It cannot grant this state aid yet, right? So if it hasn't been granted, it, you have to say, the court is obliged to say, you can't grant it until this is authorized. That effect, is, you, if, if the court says, no, no, I'm going to wait, then it's depriving the whole per the, per the, the procedure of its whole purpose. Uh, if the European Commission has not initiated a formal examination procedure, um, then the national court has to look at state aid law by itself. It has direct effect. So it's up to the national court to decide if it's state aid and therefore if it should have been notified, if it falls under a block exemption, whatever. Um, of course, in so doing, it can ask the European Commission for cooperation. As for merger control decisions, we have no precedence yet, but I think that everything that we've been looking at um, in Articles 101 and 102 and state A decisions, all of that is going to be applicable by analogy. The same rationale applies. Uh, and so you're going to, when the issue comes up, you can just look at this case law and say, well, the same lessons have to be, in, have to be drawn for merger control decisions and their binding effect. <clears throat> so this would be, for example, just to give you a practical example of where this would come up. Uh, somebody, has a, um, somebody has a contract with, uh, um, or like there's a public tender, for example, uh, involving a merged entity and that merged entity is illegal because it wasn't notified. Right, and there is a suspension of the effects. It can't; the merger cannot produce any effects. Um, it might be; it might come to be authorized later, but it's certainly illegal now. And so, uh, there might be proceedings to say, "Look, um, something has to be done now." Um, and so, th these kinds of issues may also arise. And now, commitment decisions. So, commitment decisions um, are decisions under Article Nine of Regulation One Two Thousand and Three. And I think every member state has its own version of it in, in their own competition acts. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, a, co a company is being investigated for an infringement. And in exchange for the competition authority closing the case without saying that there was an infringement, the, the final decision does not say that there was an infringement. In exchange for that, the company offers certain commitments and accepts to be bound by those commitments. These commitments might go even further than what the European Commission or Competition Authority would be allowed to impose under EU law, right? This might, this might be more than is needed to ensure uh, proper competition on the market, uh, or it might not. The reason I'm pointing this out is that you can't, you can't make the automatic connection between uh, this commitment um, represents the behavior which was required by competition law before. Um, it might but it might represent more than that, right? So you, it might also represent uh, less than that if the decision has been badly done. Um, so the decision does not certify compliance. It doesn't say uh, everything was fine. Quite on the contrary, it doesn't say anything. It's, it's, a, it's just silent about that. And it certainly doesn't legalize past behavior. It's not saying, well, now that you've offered these commitments in exchange, everything retroactively is fine. Not at all. What it's saying is we're not going to decide whether there's an infringement, we're not going to impose a sanction, but for the future, you will do this. Um, and the tendency, because of this structure of commitment decisions, the tendency ever since the beginning, uh, ever since Regulation 1 2003 was adopted, was to assume that they would really have no value whatsoever in follow-on actions because they're not declaring an infringement. Right? 
The thing is, ever since then, we've had a lot of cases involving, well, we've had some cases involving commitment decisions, both in annulment proceedings um, by third parties who are affected by these commitment decisions, and in a, a referral, right? And you have those cases uh, identified there. And it turns out that we were wrong. It turns out that the court has already now told us in Gazorba, the court has told us there are binding effects arising in the context of commitment decisions. Um, I, for one, was surprised. I didn't see that one coming, but the logic of the court is, uh, uh, is infallible, I think. And the reason I didn't see it coming is that I wasn't aware of the courts, I, I wasn't aware of the details of the court's case law in the annulment proceedings. So in order to understand the reasoning of why the court gets to where it does in Gazorba uh, in a private enforcement referral, you have to understand first the, how the court interpreted, uh, interpreted uh, the law on commitment decisions in annulment proceedings. And the, the, the position that the court finally adopted in Gazorba was already foreshadowed. To be, to be fair, the position in Gazorba is, is phrased in a way that is not the clearest in the world, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, it, it, this was foreshadowed by a judgment of uh, the Paris uh, Court of Appeal in 2017, which overruled a prior decision of the first instance court that said no binding effect. And here, the competition of uh, the, the, the Court of Appeals said, yes, there is a binding effect, very much for the same reasons that then the European Court is going to say that there is. So let's see how that's possible. Well, the reason why that's possible is that a commitment decision is, a, is the end of a procedure. In the middle of that procedure, or near the end of that procedure, there is a preliminary assessment, uh, usually in the form of the statement of objections. And that preliminary assessment is a document where the commission says, we have looked at this practice. We believe that this infringes competition law because of this, this, and that. It identifies certain competition concerns, and it gives the, the company the chance to defend itself before it adopts a final decision. It is in reply to these preliminary concerns that the company comes forward and says, uh, look, we have here a, a package of solutions that's going to exclude those concerns. So don't give us a fine. Uh, we'll do this for the future and you know, we'll close the case like that. The thing is, in the annulment proceedings, the court has said that there has to be significant and effective judicial review of commitment decisions. And this is because uh, you know, it wasn't obvious to people at the beginning that there would, there would have to be judicial review of commitment decisions to protect the interests of third parties. But the cases that have come before the court have shown very clearly why that is so. So the, the, the court has said that the European Commission has identified competition concerns. It has to. And it has to identify those competition concerns, those infringements of competition law, in a very clear way so that then they're judiciable, so that then they're subject to, to, they can be subject to judicial review. Because the court says, you, you commission can only accept commitments if they solve the concerns that you identify, right? You can't just, you can't identify concerns and then accept commitments that don't, aren't enough to solve them, right? You also cannot uh, impose commitments that uh, are disproportional. And it is up to the court to control that. It is, the court is going to review that. Um, so the, the legitimacy of the commitment decision depends on there being a duly reasoned identification of the infringement in the preliminary assessment. And when the court controls the commitment decision in an annulment proceeding, it's also going to revise that declaration, that preliminary declaration of the infringement, and then whether the commitments solve it, right? And whether those commitments comply with proportionality. And this is what leads then the court in Gazorba to say that the national courts must take into account, that's the expression, the preliminary assessment by the commission. And then, this is the quote, regard it as an indication, if not prima facie evidence of the anti-competitive nature of the practice in question. Now, why the court phrased it like this, I don't understand. I mean, it, it's a very, 
uh, I mean, we can look at the, I, I should have looked at the French version to see how it was written, but I, I think it, it's not different here. Regard it as an indication, if not prima facie. Is it prima facie evidence or isn't it? I mean, it seems to be, it seems that it has to be. Otherwise, what is, what, what does an indication mean? Um, and the phrasing is, is bizarre, but if you read the reasoning, the reasoning, you know, now that we've had all this discussion, the reasoning is resting on this issue of separation of powers and exclusive competences and et cetera, et cetera. And so there, the conclusion to me has to be, yes, it is prima facie evidence. So, you know, maybe not the best phrasing here, but I think that in the future, this is going to have to be, uh, this, is going, this is going to consolidate as a requirement of prima facie evidence because in fact there has been a res judicata or at some point it becomes res judicata finding uh, of an infringement that is solved by this uh, commitment decision right um, in a preliminary assessment not in a final finding but that finding of infringement has to be solid enough for the court to be able to control it and so the court says, that is enough. That's enough. The basic idea is, you, hey, national court, you can't just ignore the fact that the European Commission looked at this practice and said, that is an infringement. But if you adopt these practices for the future, uh, it solves it. You can't ignore that. The commission said this was an infringement. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been able to adopt that commitment decision. We wouldn't have let it. Right? So that's, that's the rationale. Um, OK. The, how can uh, commitment decisions be used in uh, private enforcement actions, or better saying the preliminary assessment uh, of that commitment that preceded the commitment decision? In several ways, some of them not entirely obvious to everyone. So for example, there can be tort actions based on unlawful behaviors that were required by a commitment decision, right? If you're uh, as long as your cause of action is not the antitrust infringement in question in itself, you can say that the commitment decision is imposing upon the party to do something which is against some other law. And uh, of course, here you have the issues of, of, the, of the possible state action defense, but it's, it, uh, that only means that you might need to file a claim against the commission as well. And by the way, this is not outside the realm of possibility uh, as we already as we already have clear signs of in the case law, and then you have the possibility of tort actions that are based on the infringements that are identified in the commitment decision preliminary assessment. This is what happened in Gazorba. So this is would be what I would describe as a follow on to a commitment decision. Or you have contractual disputes based on a behavior which was required by a commitment decision. And these are the kind of disputes that lead to a nomen proceedings by third parties. That's what you had in Al Rosa, and that's what you have in Canal, Canal Plus, which is still being uh, appealed before DCJ. And you can also have disputes based on infringement of a commitment decision. Somebody said that they would do a commit, that they would do something. They didn't. They might get a fine by the competition authority for breaking the commitment decision, but they might also have a, an action for damages. Uh, for damages to people um, caused by the infringement of the obligations set forward in the commitment decision. Uh, sorry, before I move on, there is a question here by uh, Petra. What if the NCA did not issue a statement of objection and its investigation did not reach such a level, but the party proposed commitments uh, in order to finish the case? So uh, everything that I've been saying uh, applies to European Commission uh, decisions. Um, it's not at all clear that you can extend this to national competition authority commitment decision. And I have so little time that I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, but the, the rationale of the, the case law that I've been discussing is not entirely transposable to a national commitment decision, or maybe not at all transposable. Um, and Filippo says, um, you have an almost binding non-decision. It is up to the, he's asking, it is up to the defendant to prove in court there was no violation of laws as stated in the statement of objection. Yeah, so Filippo, if you look at the bottom uh, here, it's overlapping there with the logo, but this is the conclusion. Infringements identified in the preliminary assessment which preceded the commitment decision of the European Commission 
that they have prima facie evidence value. That's my interpretation of Casorba, but I, as I said, I recognize that the phrasing was not uh, the clearest in the world. Um, and so, yes, as you, as you say, it will be up to the defendant to prove uh, in court um, that the, the, the burden of proof has been shifted um, and, um, and they, have to, they have to prove the existence of the, the inexistence of the infringement. Okay, finally, what are the, how, can, uh, how can you go around this? Okay, so in principle, you might have a binding effect. How might a national court go around that binding effect? Um, one thing he can argue, so he can do it abstractly or he can do it concretely in relation to the rules or in relation to the decision. And in abstractly, he can say that Article 9.1 of the Damage Directive is invalid, that it violates EU fundamental rights. Um, when it sets up an irrefutable presumption, right? Um, but then again, why would that be true for Article 9.1 of the Damage Directive and not true for the European Commission decisions and Regulation 1 2003? That's bizarre. So the discussion would inevitably be the same for one and the other. Um, I, don't, I don't really see a, a difference there. And uh, in terms of the EU as a fundamental rights that you're invoking. Um, but if you are arguing this, uh, both either for Regulation 1 2003 or for the Damages Directive, you're going to have to refer the issue to the ECJ under the Foto Frost case law. Um, or he can argue that it breaks national fundamental rights or the ECHR. Of course, if you're invoking a violation of the ECHR, that's also binding on the EU, so you should also do a referral to the ECJ. And I've also argued, even if you're just act talking about a violation of um, the member states fundamental rights uh, there is an equivalent fundamental right at the eu level so you're being formalistic you're also believing that there is a violation of the eu fundamental right you should enter into a dialogue with the ecj and allow them at least to express their opinion about it before you say i don't care national fundamental right is different and we're going to go that way um, and then uh, it is possible to argue that the national nca decision um, is it possible to argue that the national NCA decision review courts infringed EU law? Meaning, so this is the bottom line. You go, yeah, it is, it is uh, you know, it's a res judicata, but they decided wrong. And this happened. Um, is it possible? I, I don't think so. And it, it will be a very dangerous interpretation to do without asking the court in Luxembourg first. Um, and it might open up the, the, the door to tort actions against the member states. You can argue that the EC decision is invalid, right? Challenge the validity of the EC decision, but you have to send that to the European court because they're the only one who can control that. And you can argue the invalidity of the NCA decision, maybe. That's going to depend on the laws of each member state, but of course it becomes more complicated if you're invoking the invalidity of an NCA decision of another member state uh, before the court. Okay. Um, I'm almost out of time, and I still have the entire chapter of, of access to talk about. This was kind of on purpose, uh, and I apologize for that, but I just don't feel like talking too much about access today. And uh, the reason for that is that um, I am so frustrated by access lately that I just, I just don't want to get into this so much. Access is incredibly frustrating. Um, and I think that it, when the directive is revised, this, the rules on access are going to have to to be looked at from the perspective of claimants and people who know anything about how to uh, uh, prosecute a case of, act of private enforcement instead of just from the perspective of competition authorities. If you look at the damages directive, I'm not saying that there aren't great rules in there. There are. There are great rules to protect the uh, claimants and to make the right to damages effective. But they spend so much time. Uh, most of the provisions on access are about um, the balance between public enforcement and private enforcement. They're about protecting leniency and settlements and about protecting competition authorities. And the, the, those scales have been tipped completely to the, an, an excessive protection of competition authorities in a way that was, I think, the legislator didn't really foresee the practical consequences of, of, of what this rule would mean. Uh, but, uh, let, me, let me get to that gradually. So first, you have these, these issues regulated in Articles 5 to 8 of the directive. Um, it sets up 
some absolute protections and some relative protections. Uh, meaning relative protections are the ones that are in place until the public enforcement proceeding is over. And the absolute protections are the ones that are in place even after that. The absolute protections um, are, they, and both of them derive from this need to uh, find a balance between protecting public and protecting private enforcement. Uh, absolute protections have, are applicable to leniency statements and to uh, settlement proposals which were accepted and uh, led to a settlement. Um, the justification for that uh, is that there is a um, basically a self-incriminating element to these leniency statements and to these proposals of settlements and that therefore it's disproportional to allow um, claimants to have access to them. Uh, it's also, it would also be uh, destructive of the incentive to use these procedures, which would be terrible for public enforcement and competition policy in general. That's the argument. Uh, to the extent that uh, people would then be, the people who use these proceedings would then uh, be much more exposed to um, actions uh, by claimants. Now, I have to say, way too much energy has been spent on this. Um, this is not a thing. It's not a thing. It shouldn't be a thing. Because you really don't need access. Ah, first of all, to clarify, when we're talking about lenient protection of leniency statements and um, settlement proposals, this does not include pre-existing documents and pre-existing information, right? So it only includes that, the document which was prepared on purpose for this, right? And you cannot claim oh, I annexed the document to the leniency statement, so it's, it's protected. No, that's a pre-existing document. You also can't claim this is information which I included in the leniency declaration, so you can't have access to it, even though you're asking for another document. Of course not. Otherwise, you would be giving immunity to people who, uh, civil immunity to people who give, um, who, who are in leniency proceedings, right? Because they could just put every information that you need to prove the cartel and to prove uh, all, the, all the requisites that you need to prove, they would just put that into or annex it to the leniency statement, and then you'd never be able to prove anything. So that's, that's one thing that you need to understand. But the other is that this whole discussion is, is pointless because uh, if everything was reasonably done, you don't need to have access to this. And, you, and no court would ever give you access to this because it wouldn't pass the proportionality test. You go to court with a decision saying there was an infringement. So why the hell would you need to have access to the leniency statement which was used to uh, prove that there was an infringement? There are only two ways I can think of where you might need to have access to that settlement proposal or the leniency statement. One is if the decision itself does not say what the infringement was. Right? And as we know, it can happen. And if the decision is, if the, if the definition of the scope of the infringement is dependent on a referral to uh, a statement of leniency, which you cannot have access to, well, yeah, you have a problem there. And by the way, that would clearly be a violation of EU law. And there is an interesting discussion there um, that has to do with um, the two, the Donaukemia case especially, where the court has said that absolute prohibitions of access are a violation of the principle of effectiveness. Right, especially it was looking at a leniency statement, at the protection of leniency statements, and it said absolute rules are out. You need to be able to have a case by case assessment to protect effectiveness. Uh, you need to assess proportionality. And then one year later, it comes along the legislator and it says absolutely protected. Now, as I said, most of the times that's going to be fine, but that might actually infringe EU law. So the, the, the rule of the directive might actually be infringing primary EU law, Articles 101 and 102 to interpret it together with general principles of EU law, because it is possible, and I, uh, we, in Portugal we have a case where maybe that's what's happening, we don't know, it might be possible that you won't understand the scope of the infringement that has been declared unless you have access to the leniency statement because that's what the decision is referring to in a footnote when it is talking about the scope of the infringement. Um, this is a theoretical scenario, and in that theoretical scenario, you cannot refuse access to that part of the leniency statement. Or at the very least, it must be possible to order the competition authority to clarify what the scope of the infringement is, right? There, find some other less restrictive means of identifying what the infringement was. But most of the times this won't come up. Most of the times the problems are going to be much smaller. Um, tiny, tiny little problems that in fact 
completely deprive the right to effectiveness, uh, the right to damages of its effectiveness. Um, things like, you know, not all not all countries are have have their judicial system be entirely transparent. Um, so uh, I told you that I'm, you know, as an academic, I have to, uh, I have to, I, I love researching it and I want to keep researching. I, I, I want to keep on track of every private enforcement case that there is. Um, I'm also a practicing lawyer and I also need to have access uh, in, in, in that capacity sometimes. And I just don't know what cases have been appealed. I don't know. The competition authority adopts decisions and there is no record anywhere of that case being appealed. It's, there's no public database that I can search. It's, there is a distribution of filing of cases, of, of some types of cases, on our electronic uh, judicial system network, but it doesn't include the appeals of these decisions in the NCAs. So if I, and, and this, is just, this is why I didn't want to talk too much about this topic, because I'm so frustrated recently. Um, I'm trying to find out there was a there was a, a cartel and i know that there were two appeals and i'm trying to find out what the number of the case is so that i can ask for access to the case to see what's happening right so i, I just want access to the non-confidential version but in order to have access to that i need to know the name of the case so i can ask to have access to that case so we call the competition authority and the competition authority says oh no we're not going to give you the number of the case well, they don't actually say that but they just don't give it to us oh yeah we'll call you back and then they don't Right. And we insist, and uh, no, but why do you want to know? What do you mean, what do I want to know? It's, it's a public information, right? Why wouldn't I, why isn't that already on the website, is, is the question, right? And, uh, and then you call the court, and you ask for information, and the court says, the competition court, and the competition court says, uh, I mean, it's not the judge of the court, but competition court replies, uh, no, are you a party? Well, do you know the, num the name of the case, the number of the case? No, that's what I'm asking you. Well, if you don't know the number of the case, there's nothing I can do. Well, how can I, how can I ask for access to a case if nobody tells me the number of the case and I can't ask for access without knowing the number of the case? Um, it's, it's, it's almost Kafkian, um, but you know, it's these kind of things that it, it's already, you know, that, remember that this whole thing started because the commission, of, the commission looked at the reality of private enforcement and said, People are just not going to court to ask for damages. It's way too complicated. The rules are too complicated. Uh, litigating these cases is too difficult, et cetera. And so we came up with these simplified rules, and they're great, you know. Uh, but um, uh, so uh, Ludo is saying that they have the same problem in France, no information about pending cases. I'm sure uh, in some of your countries you've, ha you've found uh, similar difficulties. But, you know, this is all fine and well to have a theoretical framework whereby you're, you're, you're entitled to have access uh, to uh, evidence as long as you can prove that it's proportional, et cetera. That's, that's all abstractly, that's all brilliant. But then when you actually go down to the way this happens in practice, you, you don't, you're not given access. You, can't, you, don't, you don't even know where the case is or what the case is. So how can you ask for access? And then you ask for access and it's it's not given so let me give you another example uh, of one of the major problems and this i think is just a tiny detail that where the directive went too far and in so do to protect competition authorities and in so doing it effectively destroyed the effectiveness of the right to damages except for large companies right who are the only ones who can afford to hire lawyers and spend time on this issue of access and that is the rule that says that you cannot ask for access to evidence of the, of, from the competition authority um, unless nobody else can reasonably provide the documents you are asking. That is ridiculous, in my, in my humble opinion. Um, what that means is that you cannot ask the, a, a competition authority for access to the competition file because the defendants have the competition files and obviously they reasonably can provide the competition files if you ask them to. Now, what do you think happens if a potential claimant asks companies who participate in a cartel for access to files? Give me the competition the commission files, please. Can I please have the non-confidential version of the competition files? They're not gonna give them to you. They're gonna, they're gonna invoke whatever, every single legal reason they can think of, even if it's completely un, 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 unbiased, um, even if even it has no, per, no possible legal basis. And they're certainly not gonna give you 
access to confidential documentation by saying that, well, yes, proportionately, of course, you have access to this. You, should, you have the right to have access to this, otherwise you can't exercise your right. Of course, that's not going to happen. So you're going to have to go to court. Really? You're going to have to go to court to order these people to give you access to documents that you're entitled to. Now, going to court costs a lot of money. And remember, sometimes you're asking money at times. You're asking for access in order to know if you have a right to damages. You don't even know after you, you get these documents whether they'll be useful. Maybe you get the documents and you go, oh, I wasn't injured by this. So it, by saying that only competition, uh, that competition authorities do not provide access to these case files, what you're basically saying is, um, unless you're a large company, you're never going to be able to have access to the evidence that you need in order to determine if you have a right to be compensated and then what is the quantification of those damages. That's just not going to happen unless you have massive litigation, unless you group this litigation, you have money behind it somehow, and you can afford to spend time, uh, especially of lawyers, but also of economists, in uh, digging up this information, getting it, litigating it. Some, some, com court, uh, some countries don't even necessarily have a pre-filing discovery mechanism. So this might not even be possible. You have to go to court without knowing if you have a right to damages and claim that you have a right to damages in order to have access to the evidence that then allows you to know if you have an access, if you have right to damages. It's completely Kafka. So um, this is why I've left, I left only 13 minutes to talk about access because I'm, and I apologize to you guys because this is, I, I am, I'm feeling rather uh, annoyed about it today. Um, and, and so with that, unfortunate negative message. Uh, I have reached the end of our time. And I would like to ask uh, if anybody else has any, any issues. Um, uh, I'm leaving this slide up here to remind the University of, Law School, of Lisbon Law School students about what they have to do in terms of evaluation. Um, Audrey asks if I know when you're going to send, when am I going to send the PowerPoint presentation? So hopefully this afternoon, I will put together a bundle of information, um, including the judgment that was provided by Martine and some papers. And I'm going to be sending you all of this this afternoon already, okay? I will also be putting up the videos of this, um, of this workshop uh, on YouTube and sharing them, but that will probably take me a little longer to, to get around to. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I hope that you found this helpful. And please never hesitate to get in touch with me. I'm always eager to discuss uh, these issues. It's only talking to each other and exchanging uh, information about reality and about facts, what's actually happening on the ground, that we can truly understand the law and the living pulse of the law and that we can improve it. So all, please always do get in touch with me. I'm always open to um, conversations about this. Um, so thank you, thank you very much, and um, see you around some next time.